Right. So first of all, let me thank the organizers for the opportunity to give this talk. Uh, that's the title. And the subtitle could have been, and now for something completely different, not because it is about quantum gravity. You have heard uh, a few talks about uh, the asymptotic uh, safety scenario for quantum gravity. But because in this talk, uh, there is no space time. Um, and there will not be any space time until towards the end. In fact, the goal of this uh, formalism and of other non perturbative quantum gravity approaches is to provide uh, candidate theories, candidate models for the microstructure of space time from which a space time should emerge in some approximation and in some regime of the models. So I'm going to introduce for you the uh, models I will be dealing with very briefly. And only um, for those points, for those features of the models that you will need uh, in the rest. Then I will highlight what the problem of the continuum limit is in this formalism. Give you a, an overview of how the functional normalization group techniques uh, have been applied recently to tackle the problem of the continuum limit in these models. And towards the end, you will see something like a space-time, because I'll show you how we are um, extracting an effective cosmological dynamics for very simple space-times, homogeneous uh, spatial geometries, uh, from the formalism in one particular phase of the theory. So let me start. I introduce for you the formalism. The formalism is called group field theory, and it's a class of field theories. And you should understand them intuitively as a quantum field theory of space-time. And therefore, I stress once more, the fields appearing as fundamental variables in this formalism are not defined on any space-time, a space-time manifold. Is they are to be understood intuitively as quantum field theories for the building blocks of a space. So slightly more technically, they are field theories over a group manifold, actually several copies of a group manifold, and I'm dealing with, with complex fields. The corresponding phase space from which you take your data would be this co several copies of a cotangent bundle of a group manifold. The reason why these are interesting for quantum gravity um, models is that you can interpret this phase space in the appropriate dimension and with the appropriate choice of uh, gauge groups of groups as uh, the phase space for discrete simplices. This is a four-dimensional example, so d equal four. So the number of copies here is the number of uh, space-time dimension for the space-time you want to reconstruct in some regime, in some corner of the theory. And in models that are related to quantum, gra quantum gravity, sorry, the group is chosen to be the local gauge group of gravity, that is the Lorentz group, in, in uh, uh, four dimensions and Lorentzian signature. In d equal four, you're going, therefore, to have a complex field uh, taking value from four copies of the group, so a function of four group elements. If you go to the cotangent space, something like a momentum space, there will be four Lie algebra elements. And you can interpret them. Uh, I'm not going into details here, but uh, the intuitive picture is that uh, these four Lie algebra elements can be understood or put in correspondence with four area bivectors for the four triangles on the boundary of a tetrahedron, which is a fundamental building block for three-dimensional discrete uh, um, spaces. So the, this means that uh, the, being a field theory, you start from a Fock vacuum, which represents a state with no structure, no topological, no geometric structure. You start building up your states, and a single quantum of the field can be understood pictorially as such single tetrahedron, labeled by the data I showed you in the previous slide. And a generic quantum state is going to, miss, going to be some arbitrary collection of such tetrahedra, including those configurations when they are glued together. 
So you form an extended structure of a discrete uh, topological type, so a simplicial complex. There is a dual picture. Instead of uh, drawing a single quantum as a tetrahedron, you, you represent it as a vertex, a node, with four outgoing links labeled by the same group theoretic data. And extended configurations, therefore, correspond to graphs. I'll come back uh, to this in a, in, a, in a couple of slides. So you, give, uh, you specify the dynamics uh, of the field theory by defining some classical action with a quadratic part and some higher order interaction part. And the key point is that uh, the arguments of the fields appearing in the action are paired, are combined in the action, they're convoluted by group integrals in a non-local fashion. Let me show you in what sense. Again, let me stick to the d equal 4 case and to the simplicial setting. Each field corresponds to a tetrahedron. The interaction can be chosen to represent five such tetrahedra that are glued together to form a four simplex, which is a basic building block for a four-dimensional discrete space. Take five fields, each with four arguments, and you convolute them with such pairwise identification to mimic the combinatorics of the five tetrahedra that form a four simplex. So just like a, a single quantum of the field is a building block of space, a single interaction vertex like this is a building block of a discrete space-time. This becomes apparent in the perturbative expansion of the quantum theory around the trivial vacuum, because when you expand in Feynman diagrams, each Feynman diagram by construction will be a stranded diagram of the type I showed you in the previous slide, dual to some cellular complex. So you're defining the quantum theory by summing over all possible complexes that you can generate by gluing together the cells dual to the interaction vertices. The Feynman amplitudes, of course, are model dependent, but rather generically, they can be understood as uh, discrete gravity path integrals, with gravity discretized on the simplicial complex dual to the given Feynman diagram. So you're trying to define uh, a quantum theory of gravity if you have chosen the appropriate model with the appropriate data with this type of discrete geometric interpretation as uh, a sum over triangulations weighted by a discrete gravity path integral. So this is exactly the two main ways of trying to define lattice quantum gravity, dynamical triangulations on one hand and quantum graduate calculus on the other hand. Another way to represent the same Feynman amplitudes for any given model is as uh, histories of spin networks, where spin networks are exactly these graphs labeled by group theoretic data that I showed you earlier which are the states of such field theory, and they are also the sum over history's formulation of loop quantum gravity. In fact, you can see loop quantum gravity as a sort of, uh, uh, you can see group field theories as a second quantized reformulation of loop quantum gravity in the very general sense that uh, the states of quantum or loop quantum gravity appear as particular many body states in a group field theory formalism. Again, there's no point in going into details, but here I just wanted to highlight, therefore, that uh, you bring together ideas and structures for, from several approaches together within a quantum field theory formalism. The reason why this is useful is that, uh, as I'm going to discuss in all the rest of the talk, these quantum field theory methods are crucial to deal with large number of the discrete degrees of freedom that are at the root of all these approaches. And the problem of dealing with the large number of degrees of freedom sector of the formalism is indeed the main open problem in all these approaches. So here is just propaganda. So it's just group field theory as, the, as a crossroad in the sense that I try to uh, highlight of several formalism and ideas. <clears throat> 
course, it's a crossroad. You may decide that you, you're going the wrong direction and come back from where you were coming from, either from loop quantum gravity or tensor models and dynamical triangulations or uh, lattice quantum gravity, but it remains the fact. Okay, the open issues that I, that I mentioned for quantum gravity are, are many, but the one and all of them acquire a different uh, uh, interpretation and can, and can be tackled in a very fruitful way thanks to this uh, field theoretic uh, formalism. The one I will focus on is the continuum limit, which I interpret here to be the task of controlling the quantum dynamics of more and more of the interacting degrees of freedom that this formalism, these approaches are based on. So what is really the problem? Sure. Four group elements, yes. Is the R measure on the on the group? Yes. Yeah. That's the, this is the. Well, the, the, the sure. From the from the formal point of view. Yes. If you were dealing with this complex scalar field on the sphere, it would be a, a group field theory on SU two, because the three sphere is SU two. The extra peculiarity that uh, it was not in your summary, and uh, I'll try to emphasize it again, is the fact that the interactions are not local on the group, meaning that the various arguments of the field, uh, or the various fields that appear in the interactions, are not all identified locally, meaning you don't just assume that the whole interaction takes place at one point on the group manifold. But you do not, yeah, but you do not, yeah, yeah, but even, well, discrete, it's a Lie group, so there are continuous variables, but, yes, but you, you identify in interactions, uh, for example, one group element from one field interaction with one group element in another field in interaction, not all four of them, which is what you would do in, in a local field theory. Apart from this, the summary is perfect. So the problem of the continuum is that we are starting from uh, degrees of freedom that, as I try to emphasize, a priori do not have an interpretation in terms of smooth manifolds or smooth uh, metric or matter fields. And you want to, uh, you want to get to um, a space-time. In particular, you have a, a direction to explore, which is the one of increasing the number of degrees of freedom. And I want to emphasize that uh, this direction is independent from the classical to quantum limit or approximation. The reason why I emphasize that is that we know a lot uh, in, uh, in all these uh, quantum gravity approaches about the classical limit of states and histories where few of the initial degrees of freedom are involved. So where you stay at the discrete level. That is more or less under control. What is not under control is this continuum limit, okay? The non-perturbative sector of the theory, if you want. Okay, and the tool, the crucial tool to study this uh, limit of more and more degrees of freedom is, as you know much better than I do, the renormalization group. So what we do expect, in general, is that uh, the renormalization group will allow you to study the collective uh, behavior of such interacting degrees of freedom. And in general, we, because they are quantum and interacting, we should expect that when we increase the number of such degrees of freedom that we deal with, we are going to find different phases separated by phase transitions. So part of the problem here is to study the phase diagram of the corresponding theory, the corresponding field theory, the group field theory. And again, for, to guide your intuition, we're, yeah. Yeah, we can use it also at the discrete level for perturbative renormalization, but yes, we are studying, I'll, I'll show you in the next few slides how we use the renormalization group so far. Uh, the 
you should think of, uh, from the point of view of the problem of reconstructing a space-time, the intuition we have is that we should deal with these group field theories as the analog of the atomic quantum field theories in a condensed matter system. I gave you the quantum field theory for the atoms, and I ask you, okay, extract the hydrodynamics, extract the macroscopic phase diagram, tell me if you get a superfluidity or the like. So this is what we try to do. And uh, this, goes, uh, this work we are doing uh, in the group field theory setting goes in parallel with uh, a lot of work that is going on in these related approaches in loop quantum gravity, spin forms, and so on, where indeed we know about different phases of the corresponding quantum theories, although not yet for many of them at the dynamical level. So let me go to the, uh, exa to the use of the functional randomization group. The, the idea is to be naive, meaning that uh, let's take seriously the fact that we are dealing with quantum field theories. For a second, let's forget about the absence of a space-time, the, the interpretation that is quite exotic of the quantum states and of uh, the effective physics we want to get to. Let's forget about that. Let's treat them as standard, ordinary quantum field theories on a group manifold. So we use the group structures, the killing form, the topology, and so on, to define a notional scale. So in practice, we do what you would do in, uh, in standard field theory. You expand in modes, where the modes are the eigenvalues of the Laplacian, for example, on that manifold. And that defines for you a, state, uh, a scale. The subtleties will come at the con in the context of the uh, interpretation. But formally, you can just keep going. You index uh, the scales by group representations, and you set up the, uh, the, the standard randomization group analysis. The main difficulty, and that's why I emphasized earlier that that was a key difference from local field theory, is to keep track of the complicated combinatorics of the diagrams, of the Feynman diagrams of these field theories at the perturbative level, but more generally of the interactions that can enter, the possible interactions that you can have in a GFT action at the non-perturbative level. And that forces you to redefine or adapt several notions from uh, field theory, from standard field theory, local field theory. So we are doing that. The class of models where we know more are those uh, where we have a, a sort of an analog of a locality principle which is the so-called tensor invariance, or tensoriality, as they call it. So you define a class of models in which an infinite <coughs> set of possible interactions are labeled, are in one-to-one -one correspondence with bipartite decolored graphs. So if you have a complex field, you, you uh, associate a field with a white node, a complex field with the uh, black node, you color the arguments of the field, and you force yourself to only glue along same colors. This gives you bipartite color graphs. You can classify all the possible uh, contractions of fields corresponding to such graphs, and that gives you the theory space. It's infinite. It's large enough, but it's characterized by this sort of uh, uh, symmetry principle. And then you choose, uh, as kinetic term, a uh, Laplacian on the group manifold, which is consistent with the way we're defining scales. OK, this is a, a typical Feynman diagram, which I don't discuss. But each of these bubbles is a possible interaction vertex. That's where the non-locality of the interactions comes in. You see, you don't get a node with one, two, three, four lines coming out, but you get something with some internal complicated structure. OK, so from this point onwards, once you understood what is the key technical difficulty, it's field theory. Meaning, um, you just set up, as I will do next in the next slide, the standard functional randomization group analysis in terms of the Vettery equation. And you compute the beta functions whenever you can. <laughs> 
just, uh, well, I'll skip this. In case somebody asks, I'll say more about the geometry interpretation of, uh, of these scales and of this uh, flow. But let me keep going here. So at the perturbative level, uh, I just mentioned that there is a lot of work. We know a lot of uh, renormalizable models to all orders in perturbation theory. We know just renormalizable models, super renormalizable models, and of course we know non renormalizable models as well. We are, we are gained uh, quite a lot of experience. What seems to be generic is that uh, we find asymptotic freedom. And whenever we don't get asymptotic freedom, we get quite easily asymptotic safety for such models, which is nice. And the task is to deal with more and more complicated models where the complication are the uh, details of the interactions and of the, um, um, well, the sort of ingredients that go in the definition of the field to match a proper discrete geometric interpretation. Okay, so at the non-perturbative level, which is what is needed to, to do um, the continuum limit, to study the continuum limit, there have been two main uh, directions. I will only mention the, this, I will only discuss a little bit more this first one based on the functional renormalization group analysis. But there's been a lot of work on just constructive uh, renormalization by more mathematically inclined people than I am. So uh, let me just mention the result. It has been uh, first uh, uh, introduced, this uh, strategy, by Astrid and uh, Tim, but uh, in, a, in, a, in a slightly different manner. But uh, the, we followed from that uh, by uh, applying the functional normalization group uh, Alavetech mainly, uh, to, again, more and more complicated models, starting from abelian ones with almost no geometric uh, ingredient, no extra complication motivated by discrete gravity. Then we started adding all these little complications. Then we went non-abelian. I just highlight what, what we seem to be finding in rather general terms, which is uh, we, we seem to find up to now in very simple truncations, the one that we were able to study analytically, because most of the work has been uh, analytic, we generically find two fixed points, a Gaussian one in the UV and something like a Wilson-Fisher fixed point in the IR. And uh, so we confirm uh, the perturbative analysis that was actually rigorous, so it's more the other way around, uh, about asymptotic freedom in the UV. And we find hints of uh, a symmetric phase and a condensate phase. The condensed phase is interesting for uh, what I'm going to say in the last uh, five minutes. Uh, much yeah. uh, which is, uh, we look in particular at condensate states uh, of these field theories to extract effective continuum physics and cosmology. That's why this uh, uh, more formal work of renormalization group analysis is also directly interesting for the effective physics. Um, the first work on this uh, functional normalization group on uh, group field theories was in this paper co-authored with Dario, who is also here, and Joseph Benjelun. Um, here I wanted to say something more in detail, but I mean, I'm talking to experts, so this is really a, a few slides that will really be for non-experts, because uh, it's really setting up the usual uh, uh, functional normalization group analysis Keep in mind that the scale is uh, given by group representations and uh, that the interactions that you have to add are of this non-local type. So a truncation is not only a truncation in the order of the polynomial in the field, but you also want to make sure that you include all possible combinatorial structures <coughs> at the same order. And extending the truncation sometimes means maintaining the order but adding more of these combinatorial structures. So already that is quite non-trivial. So the rest is the standard stuff you know better than I do. Okay, so the result is, is summarized by the previous slide, so there's not much more to say. And this is, for example, at order four um, in a model of three dimensions, meaning uh, three arguments for the field three possible ways in which you can pair the arguments. So these are three possible interaction terms, all at order four. Okay. 
uh, okay, I, I, I skip the details and I use my last five minutes to tell you something about uh, uh, cosmology. So, so that you can, see, you can see some physics, at least towards the end. Um, all right, let me, let me skip this. Again, this was an example in which not only we had the non-trivial non combinatorial structure, but the uh, domain was non-compact. So we had to deal also with the uh, um, IR divergences and take a properly defined uh, thermodynamic limit. And the definition of thermodynamic limit could not be the usual one as in local field theories. You have to think a bit harder also about these more basic um, ingredients. Again, however, we find a Gaussian ultraviolet fixed point and a Wilson-Fisher fixed point and the same hints for a condensate phase in the IR. OK, let me skip. This was another slightly more complicated model. OK, the task, if you want to extract the continuum physics, is to identify the relevant phase where you have a, a good continuum geometric interpretation for your states and dynamics. And this is absolutely non-trivial, because as I try to emphasize, generic states do not allow any interpretation in terms of extended geometries, let alone smooth. Okay, neither classical nor quantum. It's really a different set of degrees of freedom. In particular, you want to match, uh, you want to bridge the huge gap between this microscopic uh, set of degrees of freedom and effective models for cosmology. And the closest one to, uh, to the type of formulas we're using would be something like loop quantum cosmology because of the type of variables we're using. So I, um, here I don't want to go again into detail, but the, the general point is that uh, if you rethink what um, the cosmological principle and in general a cosmological approximation is from the point of view of quantum gravity, the idea suggests itself that cosmology has to be understood as a sort of hydrodynamics of these uh, many microscopic uh, degrees of freedom. So the task is really to extract the hydrodynamics once I gave you the atomic field theory. Unfortunately, we have much less control than we have for systems on space-time about the general symmetries. Because if we knew very well the symmetries that the microscopic models satisfy, well, the hydrodynamics is the dynamics of the global quantities, of the conserved quantities. So there would not be much um, room. So in general, this step from microphysics to cosmology will involve a huge cost graining, both of the states and of the dynamics. And this is uh, difficult. Try going to a condensed matter theorist and uh, say, OK, this is the theory for the atoms. Now tell me what is the corresponding macroscopic uh, physics from first principles. If you survive the encounter, you will at least learn the lesson that uh, it's difficult. And it's not something you ask uh, so naively. But we already heard uh, this morning, I think, that there is one example in which the microphysics dictates a little bit more what the effective macrophysics uh, should be. And those are superfluid, or in other words, uh, condensates. So that's a very special case. And because of that, that's the first one we study but we have a good geometric reason to, um, to look at that. In fact, one can show that problem number one, which is to identify a class of quantum states in the fundamental theory with some continuum space-time interpretation, is uh, well tackled by condensates of the group field theory formalism. In fact, uh, one can show, and I'll skip the, I'll skip the details, although I, no, I didn't receive any... any bad look up to now from the chairman. So, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll go fast. I'll try to finish, and then in case I'll come back. Okay, there will be, I hope there will be questions anyway, so I don't want to take all my time. So one, what one can show is that uh, the simple quantum uh, group field theory condensates have the interpretation of continuum homogeneous spaces. So they are well suited for cosmology. This is the simplest example. 
remember we have a Fox space underlying our theory, so we can create uh, particles uh, acting with a creation operator, which is just a field operator. You can even create an infinite number of particles by acting with an infinite number of uh, field operators. If you do it with this particular type of exponential operator, you do something special. You create uh, an infinite superposition of uh, zero, one particle states, two particle states, three particle states, all with the same wave function, sigma, which is the order parameter, is the collective uh, parameter for this all infinity of degrees of freedom. You have a single function on a domain which you can show, if you've done things correctly, to be isomorphic to mini superspace. So the space of homogeneous continuum spatial geometries. This means the following that, okay, I'll skip uh, another bunch of details, which I'm happy to come back to. This is where I was. It means that uh, when you extract uh, the effective macroscopic dynamics for such condensate states, what you're going to get is some generically nonlinear equation for such collective wave function. If you know about uh, superfluids and uh, uh, from the microscopic point of view, that's exactly what happens. And in fact, uh, just following the usual procedures, what we obtain is that uh, the Gruffield theory analog of the gross pitayeski hydrodynamics, so the simplest form of hydrodynamics for a superfluid, neglecting fluctuations and quasi-particles and all these uh, interesting features, is a nonlinear extension of quantum cosmology, where the dynamical variable is the collective wave function that I introduced in the previous slide that governs this uh, infinity of microscopic degrees of freedom for those very simple states, and which is, as I emphasized, a function on mini superspace. So at least it's consistent. But it's hydrodynamics, so the equation you get is nonlinear. It cannot really be interpreted as the quantization of mini superspace. Okay, so we get an example in which cosmology comes out as quantum gravity hydrodynamics. Okay, so this, uh, and the effective equation is nothing else than the classical equation of motion for the group field theory field, just like in BC. Now I show you just one more concrete model in one minute, two minutes. Yeah. Okay, so we start from the favored, well, by many, um, microscopic model at the spin foam loop quantum gravity level. We write it as a group field theory. This is called the EPRL model for four-dimensional Lorentzian gravity. The group is SU2. And the dynamics, so the action of the group field theory, encodes a bunch of extra complications needed to ensure the geometric interpretation, which I spare you. We couple a free massless scalar field, plus we do a bunch of other approximations, and the coupling is just an extension of the domain of the group field theory field from the arguments that only encode the discrete geometry to an extra real variable, which has to become the continuum free massless scalar field in the appropriate regime. Um, okay, then we have to modify the model by adding appropriate dynamics for such extra variables. But again, let me emphasize, we do that by only having under control and not fully the discrete level. We know that we are adding variables and uh, putting conditions on this on these variables, uh, so that there is a good interpretation as a discretized uh, scalar field on a lattice uh, on where we have also discrete gravity. There's no yet any input from continuum physics. Then we reduce to isotropic uh, configurations, and this basically means that our collective wave function is a function of just one spin and the real variable representing the scalar field. Okay? Here. <coughs> 
Then we extract an equation, which is just the condensate hydrodynamics from the microscopic theory, following uh, the steps I mentioned in the previous slides. It's, an equ it's a nonlinear equation. You see this sigma to the fourth term for the sigma function, a function of j, one spin, and phi, the real field. And these functions aj and bj come from the microscopic theory. OK? Then we find that there are two conserved quantities. And we can also rewrite in more hydrodynamic-like form the wave function, the um, Madelung representation. And this mj, just the ratio of the microscopic coefficients. OK, then we look at observables. We want to rewrite this uh, dynamics in terms of the dynamics for the total volume of the universe as defined by the microscopic states. So we write the total volume knowing the discrete geometric interpretation of each building block. Each building block is a tetrahedron, so the, there is a definition for the discrete volume of each tetrahedron. And you take the corresponding total second quantized operator, and you compute it in the condensate. And that's it. And then we have other observables that correspond to the scalar field, which uh, are consistent with the interpretation of having coupled a free massless scalar field. So we rewrite now this equation as an equation for the volume as a function of the scalar field used as a clock, OK, in fully relational terms. There's no, no coordinates, no manifold here, only the observables. Well, you obtain an equation, actually two equations, and you can show, first of all, that the volume remains positive on all solutions, which means that generically you have a bounce. You never get zero. Second, you show that uh, when you take a classical approximation, you get the Friedman equations. So you can really interpret these uh, generalized equations as generalized Friedman equations with the quantum corrections giving you a quantum bounce. And other people in London have shown that there is a corresponding acceleration. Then we have shown that uh, in some, for some special choice of condensates, you reproduce exactly the loop quantum cosmology dynamics. And you can show that depending on the solutions, you may get uh, um, an acceleration that is lasting enough efforts to avoid inflation, to avoid the need for inflation. This is all preliminary, but at, at least is encouraging. Thank you.